Hello, everyone. My name is Siobhan, and I'm the Operations Manager for RC Forward, a charitable platform that makes effective giving easy for Canadians. And I am so excited to welcome you to our first ever International Effective Giving Day. Our vision for this day is to build a space for people to come around the world and learn about the most pressing issues facing humanity and how we can solve these problems in the most effective way. It's a big task and effective giving plays an important role in this work. Over the next two hours, you'll hear from scientists, evaluators, and advocates who are finding and promoting effective solutions within different cause areas, including global health and development, animal welfare, and climate change. These experts will share their insight and knowledge to help you ensure that your charitable giving does the most good possible. You know, we're living in challenging times here. In addition to living through a global pandemic, we are making insufficient progress on climate change. Hundreds of millions of people are living in extreme poverty and billions of animals are suffering in factory farms. These problems are large and they're urgent, but the good news is, is that they're also solvable with the talented people and the right support. Today, you'll get to hear from some of the leaders who are tackling these problems head on. Our keynote speaker, Nobel Laureate Professor Michael Kremer, will discuss how randomized control trials play an important role in determining which interventions best help people experiencing extreme poverty. Dr. Neil Buddy Shaw, Managing Director at GiveWell, will explain how they use research to determine which charities save or improve the most lives per dollar, and he will present GiveWell's new charity recommendations. Leah Edgerton, Edg Executive Director at Animal Charity Evaluators, will share her team's methods for evaluating organizations and will also present their new recommendations for people wanting to help the most animals. Johannes Akva, Climate Lead at Founders Pledge, will explain the principles enabling high impact giving for individuals introduce new climate recommendations, and elaborate on how the U.S. elections and COVID-19 play into optimal giving choices around climate change. And last but certainly not least, Charlie Bressler, Executive Director of The Life You Can Save, will discuss the specific opportunities available to many of us to save lives from the comfort of our own living room. Now, if that sounds too good to be true, we really hope you stay tuned for Charlie's talk. I hope you're all as excited as I am to hear from these talented individuals. But just before we dive in, I wanna hand this off to Sebastian who briefly introduced the concept of effective giving. Thank you and I hope you enjoy the day. Thanks Shuban and hello everyone from Berlin, Germany. I'm Sebastian and I'm the executive director of effective-spenden.org the platform that enables uh, German donors to support some of the most effective charities in the world in a tax deductible way. The Effective Giving Day welcomes people at different stages of their giving journey. So uh, we want to start with a brief overview of what effective giving is. Well, effective giving is about supporting the charities that can do the most good with your donation. And it acts on the knowledge that some charities are just much more effective than others. And I'm not talking about like 10% more effective or even 50% more effective, but 10 times as effective. And in exceptional cases, even more than 100 times as effective. And while this huge range, variety and effectiveness may sound like a crazy talk, we actually do see it in the for-profit world all the time. Just think about when Apple introduced its first iPhone. It wasn't just 10% better than the competition. Or when Netflix introduced the streaming service, it wasn't just a little improvement compared to Blockbuster Video. These companies ran circles around the competition. And why should it be different in the nonprofit world? Well, actually, it is different, but not necessarily in a good way. In the for profit world, people who are paying are also the people who are consuming the products and services. So if a company offers a bad price performance ratio, the company will probably um, be out of business soon. That's different in the non-profit world of charities. There, the people who are actually consuming the products and services of an NGO are usually not the ones who are paying. 
or at least not paying the full price. So there is no direct feedback mechanism. And the result is um, that people tend to continue to donate to a charity, even if they have like a really bad price performance ratio. And unfortunately, for a lot of uh, charities, um, it's yeah, kind of important or rather important to tell a simple and compelling story to their donors, then work on the price performance ratio and really try to get um, the best bang for the buck or do the most good they can do with every dollar they have available. So the lack of this direct feedback mechanism um, may actually lead to the variety of effectiveness uh, between charities to be even bigger than that in the for-profit world. So what can we do about it? One uh, common answer I hear is that um, one should uh, rely on existing charity watchdogs, like Charity Navigator in the United States or the uh, DZI Spendensiegel in Germany. If you look a little closer, Unfortunately, their recommendations are not that helpful, at least if you want to do the most good um, you can. One reason is that they um, rely on seemingly easy to measure uh, metrics like the uh, charity's overhead ratios. And to see why this ratio isn't extremely helpful, we can again look to the for-profit sector. Just think about um, the last time uh, you wanted to buy a new smartphone. Let's say you were not sure if you should go for an Apple product or a Samsung product. Did you actually look at the um, overhead ratio of those companies? I bet you didn't. And I mean, why should you? What you want is to get the best deal um, and get the most yeah, bang for the buck and um, for according to your needs. And so, yeah, you look at the price performance ratio and try to make a decision in that way. And I think uh, more people should do so in um, the nonprofit world when they think about donating as well. Of course, measuring um, the impact an organization has is pretty difficult and comparing one to, each, uh, one to another is also very difficult. But it's not impossible. And actually, we have made a lot of progress in the last couple of years. So today there are many yeah, smart and dedicated people uh, working on finding charities um, doing a tremendous amount of good. And organizations like GiveWell, Animal Charity Evaluators, or Founders Pledge have spent thousands of hours to answer this um, question. And they also didn't start from scratch. They couldn't build on the work of academia, government, the for-profit world. And in the case of Gilfell, for example, on yeah, Nobel Prize winning research, we will hear more about later today. The effective giving movement is not only about finding the best charities though, it's also about generously funding them. And I think we can and should fund them. We are lucky to live in time of unprecedented um, opportunities. Humanity has never been richer before. Actually, if you are living in a rich country and earn more than $52,000 a day, uh, sorry, a year, a year, um, you are part of the global 1%. And if you earn more than $28,000 a year, you're still part of the global 5%. So there's a lot of money going around. And also the effective giving movement is pretty young. So that means there are still a lot of great deals out there. Where you can do a tremendous amount of good. So when I first learned about how much better some charity really are, I wondered why not more people acted on it. I mean, if you have a yeah, well-paying job in a rich country, you could easily save the life of a child every year. Or you could spare thousands of animals, life in factory farms. Or you could prevent thousands of tons of CO2 to reach the atmosphere every year. If you spend your money wisely, you can really make a tremendous amount of difference. I mean, just think if you donate 1%, 5%, or even 10% of your income, you could potentially save more lives than a superhero and still live a life of comfort, safety, and opportunity our ancestors only dreamt of. And actually many people still dream of today. 
So in order to make these wise decisions and actually become the superhero, I'm proud to present some of the world's leading experts working to answer these questions. And as Shivan said, like if you have any questions, put them um, in the chat next to this video and our moderators will try to pass them on um, to the um, speakers. So before we finally start with our first speaker, um, I would like to introduce some of my colleagues, colleagues working for fundraising organizations all around the world and try to help you to donate in a tax deductible way wherever you are. So here you go. My name is Pablo Melchor and I am the president of Ayuda Efectiva. We are a nonprofit that makes effective giving easily accessible and tax deductible for donors in Spain. Donando Ayuda Efectiva contribuyes a financiar los proyectos humanitarios que con un mismo coste salvan más vidas o ayudan más a más personas. Infórmate en ayudaefectiva.org. G'day from Sydney, Australia. I'm Luke Freeman, the executive director of Giving What We Can. Giving What We Can is an effective giving community. We have over 5,000 members from more than 80 countries who've pledged to give a meaningful portion of their incomes to the organizations that can most improve the lives of others. Our community provides support, advice, news and education for cause-neutral, effective giving. You can find our giving recommendations, join our community and more at givingwhatwecan.org. We're also integrated with Effective Altruism Funds, which helps donors to pull their money together so they can find outstanding giving opportunities that are evaluated by expert grant makers and charity evaluators. EA funds are tax deductible in the US, UK and Netherlands. They can be found at effectivealtruism.org slash funds. And I'm also here today on behalf of Effective Altruism Australia. EA Australia helps Australian donors make tax deductible donations to some of the most effective charities working in global health and development. We work closely with our charity evaluation partner GiveWell to select highly effective individual charities, as well as allowing donors to pull their funds together and donate to whichever partner charity can do the most good with their donation. You can find us at effectivealtruism.org.au. Thank you. My name is Andreas Stroberlund. I represent eeffective.anno. We aim to make GiveWell recommended charities more accessible to Norwegian donors and spread information about how these organizations work and why they are recommended. Through us, donors in Norway can get a tax refund and donate to these organizations in an easier way. I also represent Effective Altruism Norway who runs a separate donation portal at effectivealtruisme.anno slash portal, where donors can donate to other cause areas and get a tax refund. These cause areas include animal welfare and the long-term future. I hope you enjoy this very first Effective Giving Day. Hey Lena, my name is Henry Thunberg and I'm based in Stockholm, Sweden. Together with a few fellow EA friends and Norwegian counterpart yeeffective.no, we're now launching the Swedish site yeeffective.se. If you have any questions or thoughts on how we can be better at bringing effective giving to Sweden, let us know and wish us luck for giving season 2020. Hey now! Hi everyone, my name is Jack Lewis and I'm the executive director at One for the World. We ask people to pledge 1% of their income for life to the most effective charities working in global health and poverty. We can help donors make tax deductible donations in the US, the UK, Australia and Canada. If you'd like to know more, please get in touch or go to oneforttheworld.org. Thanks very much for your support. Good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. My name is Sebastian Schienle. I'm part of the Effective Spenden team in Germany. And it's my pleasure to now introduce the first presentation of the day and to welcome Johannes Aqua, Climate Lead at Founders Pledge to talk about effective climate philanthropy. Um, Founders Pledge is a global community of entrepreneurs that I'm sure many, most, maybe all of you are familiar with. Um, they work to find and fund the highest impact giving opportunities, including on climate change. And uh, the work on the topic has been featured in media like the New York Times and Vox. Uh, Johannes leads the climate work at Founders Pledge and has been passionate about the topic since his early uh, days as an environmental activist before joining Founders Pledge about one year ago, 
He spent five years working uh, at a think tank advising policymakers in Germany, the EU, and North America on climate policy. As climate, uh, excuse me, as Founders Pledge has been a leading voice on effective climate philanthropy since starting their work uh, on the topic about three years ago. I'm very pleased that we have an opportunity tonight to get an update from Johannes on their latest thinking and their recommendation. Um, as, a, as a quick reminder, we will have a brief Q&A at the, at the end of this presentation, so please put your questions in the chat. And with that, over to you, Johannes. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for the nice introduction. And yeah, I hope you, yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, and I want to talk with you about high impact climate philanthropy and especially also the question of where should you give at this very moment. And if there's only like one thing you remember from this talk uh, about where to give effectively, I want this to be this one here. This like focus on supporting solutions that have a leverage on global emissions. And I'm going to talk about uh, the why and the how of that in the next couple of minutes. But that's kind of really the important message to remember in terms of effective climate philanthropy. And yeah, first kind of, we have to get a sense of what is actually um, the challenge that we're facing and what does that, so like, what is actually, what does that actually mean? And this is kind of the challenge that we're facing. So this is energy growth um, over the last two centuries or so. And energy is about 80% or so of like long, long lasting emissions are related to energy. So it's kind of crucial, it's the centerpiece. But we can kind of see that, okay, over the last 200 years or so, energy growth has been really increasing and increasing rather massively, especially in the last 15 years. And at this point, essentially energy growth is, is mostly just fossil growth. So emission growth, that, that means. And yeah, what we can see here is that essentially, if we want to meet climate goals, uh, we need to get this number of this like high carbon energy essentially to zero by 2050. So over the next 30 years. And at the same time, we need to like support a world where energy demand is increasing. And that's mostly because people are escaping poverty. So we kind of need to plan for an energy system, for a global energy system that's at least twice the size, probably triple the size or much larger by the end of the century. So this is really like a vast challenge. And yeah, as I already stressed, what makes this challenge even harder, and especially harder, I guess, for us to solve, most of us living in OECD countries is that most of the growth in energy demand is not going to be where we are. So roughly speaking, you can say like OECD countries maybe like have this, like as I'm showing my mouse, like about half or so of emissions right now, that share of energy, sorry, of energy, that share is going to remain roughly constant over the, or that that absolute number is going to stay roughly constant over the uh, coming decades. So all of this big bulk of energy demand that's kind of needs to be affected that needs to go to zero carbon, almost all of that or very large share of that is kind of coming from regions that we're not kind of directly citizens of. So kind of the challenge of effective climate action when you're in an OECD country about effective climate giving is like how can we actually make that share lower carbon? And that challenge is again, like already it's kind of vast, but it's like even vaster because well, um, the growth that is going to happen in uh, developing and emerging economies is kind of usually a lot more carbon intensive than kind of what we're used to. So like by default, uh, a lot of this energy is going to be quite carbon intensive. So that's really that's kind of the central climate challenge. And just to stress here one thing, like the fact that energy demand is growing is not a bad thing. It's kind of a very good thing. It means people are escaping poverty. And also this does not mean that we uh, citizens of OECD countries do not have the major responsibility for climate change. We absolutely do. It just means that when we're trying to affect this issue, we kind of need to be aware of this reality. And of course, what does it mean being aware of this reality? I think the first reaction is to become quite fatalistic, to say like, what can I possibly do on this challenge? Not very much, right? Like I can maybe reduce my own emissions. I can do something in my community so that you can kind of do that. But in a way that's kind of a kind of fatalism that's kind of saying, okay, giving up on the challenge. But there's really another way and that's kind of like moving from realizing a challenge to taking like bold strategic action to be like really smart uh, about your actions. And in, in this case, particularly right now, we're going to talk about how you can be really smart about your climate philanthropy. And the principal strategy to be smart about your climate philanthropy, because overall, like in the big scheme of things, we're all small donors, is to use impact multipliers and to make sure that your dollars go much, much further in terms of solving the problem than they otherwise would if you would use them less smartly. 
And there are three multipliers that I'm going to talk about that I think together make for a really, really incredible impact proposition for time philanthropy. One is audacious advocacy, I'm going to talk about next. The second is focusing that audacious advocacy on blind spots. And the third is doing so in a coordinated way. Um, so I'm going to talk about all of them together. They kind of constitute what we call the, the ABC of high impact climate philanthropy. Yeah, and the A for audacious advocacy is where I'll start. And I'll actually start with some, or actually not start, but until now this, this presentation is very much the typical climate is a big challenge presentation, but now I'm going to start with actually some good news. Namely that climate really is a, world, is a crisis that the world has evoked into. We can see this across Essentially, we can see this in, in Europe, we can see this in the US, we can also see that in China. Uh, so like it's really a challenge that people are becoming aware of to a much increased degree. And that means that this, like there's an amazing uh, opportunity for leverage and philanthropy. And I can just show this here. This is from an analysis we just published today. So that's the reason that the um, graphic looks a little bit less developed than the rest. But so like this is kind of the like expected leverage, like how much does, an, uh, does a donation of you kind of affect um, climate and, and like how this relates to different political environments. And what we can see here is like the C estimate for 2020 under Trump. And this is the estimate for 2021 um, under President elect Joe Biden. And we estimate that kind of this, this shift has kind of increased like the expected effectiveness of your donations by a factor of 10. Why is that? Well, because the best advocates um, influence policy and kind of the policy window has like increased so significantly that kind of the opportunity what we can actually do with philanthropy, the resources we can allocate better, et cetera. This is just a vast opportunity. And that's kind of the principal logic of audacious advocacy, using philanthropy to leverage, um, to have leverage on large societal resources and policy, et cetera. And yeah, in that spirit, we recommend currently as our top recommended charities, three charities. One of them is the Clean Air Task Force, which is laser focused on solutions across all kinds of neglected technologies and approaches. The other one is Terra Praxis, which is focused on advanced nuclear, which could be a critical part of the decarbonization solution toolbox. And the third one is Carbon 180, which is focused on removing carbon from the air, and they're very aptly named. Um, yeah, and just to kind of give you one example about like what we actually mean with this audacious advocacy that makes it a little bit more concrete. Going to focus on 45Q, which is a tax credit um, for carbon capture. Carbon capture is one of those technologies that the IPCC and everyone that kind of all energy model is considered critical for decarbonization, but that's kind of lagging behind a lot in terms of where it is and where it should, from where it should go. And the Clean Air Task Force has led a campaign on kind of um, passing a tax credit to make this technology um, more feasible in the United States context. What would this actually do? Well, this could save a lot of carbon in the US. So this is an estimate for 2030, where this kind of saves 49 million tons of carbon every year going on from 2030. And that's really a great deal. Um, but ultimately, that's not what we're after. What we're really after here in terms of like funding strategic philanthropy is we're here for cost reductions. So if you read, this is kind of what I try to show here. Uh, under a very modest learning rate, so if we like build all of the new carbon capture kind of incentivized by this tax credit. Uh, this is kind of where we would get to by 2030 or so, the price of this technology would half. And that's kind of what we really want, uh, given the global picture. And what we really want is we want to drive down the cost of technology or improve technology otherwise, and thereby enable global, global progress. And this is kind of what audacious advocacy is all about. Yeah, and sorry, I don't have any time to talk today about the assumptions. Um, but just to kind of put it in a nutshell, so you're starting with advocacy. Uh, you use this advocacy to enact policy change and like on very conservative assumptions about the impact of the Clean Air Task Force for enacting this policy. You get to something like from this advocacy, like to a price of uh, like, like for a price of carbon saved by donations at like about $1.60. Uh, so this is kind of like, hey, that's nice. But really then what we're going for is the innovation, the cost reductions, and then the next step that we're going for is kind of the global scaling. And that's kind of where you, where the multiplier comes in. So like we're using this, we're using policy to drive innovation. And then we're kind of ending up with an estimate, even under really extremely conservative assumptions of something like 10 cents per ton of carbon saved. That is the a value proposition uh, behind audacious advocacy. 
And yeah, this is how we can scale yeah, get to get an impact. And this is how we can plausibly use philanthropy to make a difference like far beyond what we could normally get to. And yeah, now kind of what would we focus our audacious advocacy? That's kind of the second uh, multiplier here. And we should focus our advocacy on blind spots and technologies and approaches that are forgotten by the mainstream, even though they are critical. And yeah, that's kind of the basic, basic second multiplier. When making plans are visible, we can have an outsized impact. Why is that so? First, if we focus on plans, but we can be sure that our efforts are additional uh, so that not someone else is just funding the very same thing or doing the very same thing. So it makes it much harder and much easier to have counterfactual impact. The second is that usually early resources spent on a, on a field are especially impactful. One example for this is Carbon 180, um, another charity I'm going to talk about in a bit, which has like uh, championed uh, a National Academy of Science report on carbon removal and negative emissions that has kind of essentially shaped how the field is perceived in the, in the United States. So like these are some very early resources that have been quite impactful. And a third part of that is really the, ch the challenge of climate is to go to zero emissions. So if we don't focus on blind spots, if we only focus on what's easy, temperature stabilization is impossible. Together, what this gives us is a curve that looks something like this, where like this is effort, overall effort that we're spending, and this is overall impact. And we should very much focus on areas where there's relatively low effort, even though they're very important. But yeah, what are actually those areas? Well, a couple of those areas, and the, here I'm going to talk about areas that the Clean Air Task Force is focusing on, uh, are like lots of hard to decarbonize sectors and industry, iron and steel, cement, load falling electricity, which means electricity that is not uh, intermittent renewables, but that can follow the load. Long distance road transport, aviation, shipping. So these are kind of some of the challenges. And my basic rule, the way I talk about clean air task force is like, if it's neglected and important, you can be pretty sure that the clean air task force will have a program for it. So that's kind of a value proposition uh, for the clean air task force, apart from being like incredibly strong organization, they're also kind of laser focused on uh, those solutions that are neglected to their potential. But they don't do everything. And there's this particular one technology bucket that we think is like incredibly neglected compared to its importance. And not only we think so, uh, but this is also, this is from a leading uh, innovation assessment that was just published a couple of months ago on priorities for the next administration in the US. The top priority where funding should increase the most compared with now by over 200% is carbon dioxide removal. And that's exactly what carbon 180 is focused on. And what is this actually? Well, carbon dioxide removal or negative emissions, as it's sometimes called, is essentially here everything that moves kind of when this is an emission trajectory over time, what moves stuff below uh, zero, which gets us to like what's called net zero. And this is really critical. All climate science, all energy decarbonization science agrees that it's critical, but has been incredibly neglected. So even like total philanthropic spending of this in the world is for something like 25 million a year. And even though this is kind of to like how to deliver a gigaton scale impact very soon. So like this is an area very neglected uh, that we focus on. And actually also the head of, um, former, former head of carbon 180 has just joined the Biden administration. And there's like, yeah, we're very hopeful that carbon 180 will be able to make a really positive uh, impact on the trajectory of that under, under the Biden administration. And then the third piece, uh, arguably the one I would usually have like to have more time to talk about, uh, is Terra Praxis, which is focused on advanced nuclear. And obviously, it's always controversial to talk about nuclear, though advanced nuclear is, avoids a lot of the things that are controversial about existing nuclear. But really, uh, the argument that Terra Praxis makes, and in a very sophisticated way, we think is that nuclear can be a uh, missing link uh, for a livable climate because it can help not only with decarbonizing electricity, also with like lots of other applications. And so they're an incredibly um, strong organization, we think as well. And also um, their advocate, Kirsty Gogan, I think is like um, one of the best advocates for nuclear in a way. And also like a very nuanced voice, not someone that's like uh, advocating nuclear at the cost of other solutions, but rather talking about nuclear in the context of decarbonization, which is ultimately what we're interested in. So that's Terra Praxis. So now I've talked about the blind spots. And yeah, the, now the last part of the C is actually uh, going to be very brief here because we're almost out of time. The C for coordination and co-funding, because uh, yeah, like if we're kind of bringing our money together, it can be more impactful. 
for lots of different reasons. We can do things like giving funding guarantees to charities, to top charities. We can react to timely opportunities, such as the changing situation in the US context. We can pool resources, which overall make things easier. And we can be more robust to uncertainty. We can like think about hedging, et cetera. And of course, it's much easier. And that is kind of why recently we have launched uh, the um, Climate Fund, uh, the Founders Pledge Climate Fund, which is our top recommendation uh, right now in climate because we're kind of um, pooling resources and doing all of these strategic things to kind of even increase the impact compared to uh, the charities that we um, recommend. Yes, just to summarize, there's the A uh, for audacious advocacy, the B for blind spots and bottleneck, and the C for coordinating or for funding. That is kind of the DNA we think of high impact climate philanthropy. It's a theory uh, behind our fund, and it's also kind of the criterion by which we like choose our charities and where I think our charities excel and prevent, uh, present a, like a great value proposition on climate. Yes, thanks very much. That's the end of my talk. Uh, you can find us and donate to the fund at, effective, at the Effective Altruism Fund. And now I'm very happy uh, to yeah, answer questions. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Johannes. Uh, thanks for walking us through your update and the, the policy recommendations. <clears throat> uh, what, one question uh, in, in that regard, you're focusing on advocacy and, and policy change. How does that compare, in your view, to um, more direct uh, offsets or uh, lifestyle changes also in terms of effective um, actions each of us can take? Yes. Um, well, if you think about offsets, so like a good offset that you can actually believe actually reduces emissions will cost at least 10, more likely $20 per ton of carbon saved. The numbers that I just showed you for, for like the Clean Air Task Force is something like 10 cents under very conservative uh, assumptions. So of course you can give to offsets, um, but like it's very, um, very hard to think that it is anywhere near the most effective thing uh, that you can do. I think it's very clear. And like, you know, like, and if you feel like that the goal is not to give less, right, but rather like give the same amount that you would give to offsets, but give this to high impact uh, charity. As for lifestyle changes, you can do lifestyle changes, but the potential of that is ultimately very limited. So like you can probably have 10 times or more impact through your giving. You don't have to be a rich person for that to be true. Uh, then you can like do through lifestyle changes, right? So like if you think, okay, a donation to clean air task force, let's say be very conservative and say like it costs like one one dollar uh, to avoid a ton of carbon. So like essentially, and you usually you a person emits something like eleven tons per year. So you could okay, let's even say it costs ten euro. Like you could you could offset your emissions with like a hundred dollars, and obviously you wouldn't have to stop there. My lifestyle changes get very painful uh, once you make some changes, right? So like it's. You can do all of those things, but this shouldn't make you lose sight of what's kind of the most effective thing that you can do. Great, thanks. And, and building on that, um, what would you say is kind of the, the, the comparison of the effectiveness between activism versus philanthropy for making an impact on climate change? Is there anything that can be done through activism directly? Absolutely, but I think, I think, I think of philanthropy as a form of activism. So both of those are forms of political action. Both of those have multipliers. Both of those are much better than focusing on your lifestyle. But I mean, for example, right now, like we have a special opportunity in the United States. Not all of us can move to the United States. Some of us are already there, but not everyone can move there and use activism. To It looks like we're using you, losing you, Johannes. Kind of improve the situation there, but we can all like achieve. What was the last thing that you heard? And so, like the, the big advantage of philanthropy, oh. the big advantage of philanthropy compared to active. Sorry. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. The big advantage of philant the big advantage of philanthropy compared to activism is that. Your money can be deployed wherever it has the highest impact, whereas your activism is quite locally constrained usually. Uh, we cannot all move to the US to improve US climate policy, but we can all give to the very best climate charities in the US to improve the outcome, and that has huge leverage. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do activism, you should do both, right? They're both kind of, for me, they're part of the same coin. Activism and philanthropy is kind of political action. Last question before we wrap up from uh, the audience. Uh, in, in your previous report, you, you included the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. You're now focusing more on uh, technology recommendations. Well, what's, uh, what's driving that change? 
Um, so the change is essentially driven by a reassessment, like we always do reassessments of our charities. And I think we've come to a different view on the effectiveness of the, of the carbon market around forests. So it's not that we don't like forests anymore. Sometimes, sometimes people are like, we don't like forests anymore. That's not true. Rather, we're much more pessimistic about the ability to uh, build up a carbon market that actually protects forests, which is kind of a major uh, advocacy proposition uh, of the Coalition for Rainforest Nations. And so like, we think this has a lot of problems. It's very intractable, whereas kind of the main route that we're focusing on right now, energy innovation does not require like high levels of global coordination, et cetera. It's like, so in that sense, it seems like a much more robust value proposition, but it's not the unpopular thing you don't like trees anymore. It's just, um, yeah, we've come to a different view on, on the feasibility of that or the relative impact of that. Great. Thank you very much. I think we're pretty much at the end of uh, our slot already. And uh, with that, I guess we'll hand back over and switch to the next presentation. Sure. You can also give to the EA fund, uh, sorry, to the fund for the Facebook Giving Tuesday, by the way, I should also say that. But yeah, thanks everyone. Hello, my name is Katja Jäger, and I support the effect of altruism movement by donating myself and also spreading the word as much as I can. And I today have with me Leah Edgerton, who is the executive director of Animal Charity Evaluators. Leah, it's great to have you. Your organization is doing research to find and promote the most effective ways to help animals. And you give recommendations of charities involved in animal related causes to donate to, and even provide a charity quiz where one can learn about the different advantages of giving to a specific charity and find the most suitable for the personal cause. 
And only recently you announced your 2020 charity recommendations that you yearly give out and we're eager to learn more. Um, and so I'm giving the word to you and for everybody, if you have questions, you can post them in the chat. I will have a cl close look on it and forward them to Yulia. Thanks. Thank you so much, Katya, and thank you very much for the organizers. It's an honor to be on such a panel of distinguished speakers, and I'm particularly inspired to see so many audience members who are attending this event who are committed to helping others with the resources that we have in life. Our event tonight brings together many of us working across a broad set of causes. We've just heard from Johannes about effective ways to address climate change, and later tonight you'll hear from some of our colleagues working in global health and development. So I wanna to talk tonight about what makes effective animal advocacy a little bit different from these other cause areas. In comparison to global health um, and development to climate change, which have very vast established academic fields with decades of studies to draw upon, animal advocacy has relatively little evidence to inform our work. There are very few studies that exist on almost any of the commonly used interventions um, the studies that do exist tend to be underfunded and hence underpowered, meaning that the results are relatively poor quality and difficult for us to learn from. And more fundamentally, the effects that we're seeking to measure are especially difficult to observe. So these are things like dietary change, behavior change, um, attitude change, and also um, like long-term change um, potentially in the uh, legal sector. So uh, what do we do about that? Well, the answer is that we're working on it and I will present some of the giving options um, in ways that you can support those types of efforts later. Um, but I also wanna draw attention to the fact that effective altruism means using evidence and reason to find the ways to do the most good. So we draw upon studies from other fields and we do take a pluralistic approach to avoid overconfidence in any one strategy. Another thing that makes our cause area particularly unique in comparison to others is that the members of the effective giving community have a relatively large influence within our very small field. So if we look, for example, at the amount of funding that the top three effective altruism organizations influenced in 2018 to farmed animals, we can see that we controlled about 25% of the funding in the movement. That's animal charity evaluators, open philanthropy, and the Center for Effective Altruism. I did a little bit of a calculation to compare this to global health and development. Um, I'll let my colleagues who are speaking later um, provide more information on that, of course, later tonight. But in comparison, I think that um, global health and development uh, from EA cause areas is influencing about 1% of the global humanitarian aid budget. So as you can see, it's a pretty different consideration that we're looking at in the effective animal advocacy cause area. So our response to addressing this is to, um, you know, while we're working in a cause where we have a lot of influence and relatively little evidence, we try to proceed with caution and we try to think about impact more broadly over the long term. So in addition to promoting individual interventions and organizations that we think are particularly effective, we try to think about the health and effectiveness of the movement overall. I'll talk about that a little bit later when I talk about some of our giving options. In practice, that has meant allocating resources across more organizations rather than fewer, um, lowering our standards of evidence for particularly promising approaches. So that's using reason again when we don't have good studies and having a higher tolerance for risk with the assumption that we just haven't necessarily uncovered all of the most effective ways to help animals yet. So in the same way that we do cause prioritization across different areas, so when we decide um, you know, as effective altruists to give our money towards causes where we can do the most good. Um, and we've identified, of course, global health and development, climate change, long-term impact, animal welfare, for example, um, we do cause prioritization within animal advocacy. So as donors who want to make the most difference for the biggest number of animals, we look for problems that are large in scale, that are receiving fewer resources than they deserve, and that have viable high impact solutions. So when we're talking about scale, uh, we look at the number of individual animals used and killed by humans. Um, so this is data from the United States, but it holds pretty much true across the globe. Um, among all the animals that are raised and killed, 
by humans, uh, about 99% of them are raised and killed for food. Um, all animals living in shelters, used in research, living in zoos, used for entertainment, et cetera, are in the remaining 1%. And then in great contrast to that, they are receiving about 1% of the total funding going towards animal advocacy. Um, predominantly the funding in this cause area goes to companion animal shelters, but is also split among um, groups working to improve the lives of animals used in research and entertainment, raised for fur, et cetera. Um, and in today's presentation, I wanted to take a minute to pre present this data in a little bit of a different way, and, and you'll find out why in a few minutes. Um, but here's just another way of looking at it. As you can see, among animals raised and killed by humans, uh, farmed animals vastly outnumber the other types of animals raised and killed. But I also wanted to mention that the only population of animals that is even larger than the number of farmed animals is the number of animals living in the wild. These animals um, suffer from predation, starvation, disease, natural disasters, but little advocacy has been focused on helping them simply because we don't know of many interventions to improve the lives of animals in the wild. So here's the moment that we've all been waiting for tonight. Um, with all that in mind, how can we as individual donors best help animals with our donations? And I wanna present three different giving options for you tonight. Um, we have our 2020 recommended charities, which as Katya mentioned, we announced last week. Uh, we also have a granting program called Ace Movement Grants that I'll talk about. And as I mentioned earlier, because of the lack of evidence in our movement, we um, have a research fund where we support uh, the creation of new research to help us be able to better inform our giving decisions and advocacy decisions in the future. So I won't get into great detail here about the charity evaluation process, but you're very welcome to look at our website where there's a lot more information. Um, generally, we use some quantitative analysis, including cost effectiveness estimates, room for more funding to assess charities, and we also look at qualitative measures for success, including whether the charity has a good leadership structure, good culture, whether they're engaged in a high impact cause area. So that's again, looking for things like farmed animals or wild animals. Um, have they learned from success and failure and um, other types of qualitative indicators of, of success where we don't have quantitative ones. So this year we have four top charities. Um, most of these are focused on reducing the suffering of farmed animals. Albert Schweitzer Stiftung, um, the Albert Schweitzer Foundation, sorry in English, and the Humane League are working to primarily promote the welfare of animals living on farms. They work with companies to um, pledge to improve the welfare of the chickens and pigs in their supply chain, for example. Um, Albert Schweitzer also has a focus on farmed fish, which we think is an ex exceptionally neglected and high scale intervention. Um, so those are pre predominantly working on, on welfare. Albert Schweitzer is working in Germany and Poland and the Humane League, while they're based in the US, they um, support a global network of organizations through the Open Wing Alliance. So they actually have quite a large worldwide impact. The Good Food Institute is also headquartered in the United States and they also um, have several international branches in pretty important regions in the world. Um, and they promote alternatives to animal protein. So they work on research and development, science and technology to promote um, alternatives to animal proteins, whether that's plant-based or cultivated in labs. Um, and then they also work on the policy landscape um, as well as the business side of things to help make those things a reality in the market. And Wild Animal Initiative is a, is a new top charity this year and they are also the first top charity that we've ever recommended that is working in the area of wildlife welfare. They um, are working within the academic field to promote the establishment of welfare biology as an academic field. So they are working to help us understand in the long term ways that we can help reduce the suffering of animals in the wild. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, that's um, kind of a, a new cause area that we're, we're seeing more and more charities work in and one that we think is especially impactful to gather more evidence on. Um, so those are our top charities. We also have nine standout charities. And these are um, charities that are doing you know, great work, um, but aren't quite as high performing in our criteria as our top charities. And um, what I'm really excited about this year is that these charities cover so much of the globe. We have our first standout charity in China, the Good Food Fund. We have many working in South America, uh, Vegetarianos Hoys in Chile, Sinergia Animal works across the continent in South America. 
the Brazilian Vegetarian Society works in Brazil, of course. And then we have charities like FIAPO in India, um, Essere Animali in Italy, and um, we have two US-based charities, Compassion and World Farming, which is also working in uh, reducing uh, animal suffering on farms, and Faunalytics, who are carrying out some really exciting original research to um, help inform animal advocates and donors on how to be more impactful in the future. Um, some of these other charities are working on meat reduction programs with schools, with public canteens, with companies. Um, some of them are working to improve the policy landscape for animals in their countries. Again, some of them working on corporate outreach and corporate campaigns. Um, there's a lot of creativity, there's a lot of different approaches, and we're really excited to see um, some local groups working within countries that um, where especially high numbers of animals are raised and killed, like India and um, China and um, Europe. So if you're a donor that um, one of those charities caught your eye, you can, you can donate through our website to any of those. Um, but if you're a donor who couldn't decide between many of those or you were excited about multiple of them, uh, we would recommend supporting our recommended charity fund. So donations that come to this fund um, get 100% passed on to our recommended charities. We disperse grants to those charities um, twice a year in January and July. And the allocation is determined by our research team at that time based on where we think it will be most effective. So we ask charities to report on their room for more funding on how much funding they've been able to bring in. And we can assess based on you know, who has what need for funding where we think this, um, these donations can be best used. And um, I can't share too much information at this point, but I highly recommend that you stay tuned to our um, communications channels over the next few days because we have a, a really great matching campaign coming up soon um, in order to support the recommended charity fund. So you can follow us on your social media platform of choice, check out our website or sign up for our newsletter to hear more. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, because of the large influence that the effective altruism movement has within farmed animal advocacy and the low amount of evidence, we don't want to be overconfident and have a kind of winner takes all effect in such a young stage of the movement. So we founded a couple of years ago the ACE Movement Grants Program, uh, which is aimed to kind of uh, complement the impact of our top and standout charity recommendations. So with this fund, we've given out more than two and a half million dollars among 108 charities in 32 countries. Uh, we have an annual disbursement and these are charities that are working in promising areas like capacity building, working in neglected regions, doing outreach to neglected demographic groups, um, maybe they have a really promising approach that we think is worth trying out, but we have very little evidence for yet. Um, so in general, these are kind of high risk, high reward uh, granting opportunities. Um, I'm really excited to share with you today that um, we're starting to see some really exciting successes from some of these charities. And actually three of our recommended charities um, from that I mentioned just a few minutes ago were actually originally recipients of ACE movement grants over the last two years. So we're really excited for the impact that this fund has had in helping fostering new effective charities that can hopefully come um, become top charities themselves in the future. And then our last giving option that I want to talk about today is the Animal Advocacy Research Fund. We've had this program for several years now. Um, it was started by a generous uh, one-time donation by a large donor, um, and we were able to grant out funds to uh, 46 different projects, which are helping us improve our understanding of effective animal advocacy. So these are studies that donors can use, that charities can use in order to help us learn, um, you know, in, an in a field where we have very little evidence, how can we make better strategic decisions? How can we better use our resources to make sure that they're helping as many animals as possible? Um, we have 22 completed projects on our website. We've been promoting open science framework policies and um, one of the most exceptionally, or one of the most exciting outcomes that we've seen is um, this is starting to build a academic field around effective animal advocacy, much in the same way that we have one around global health and development or around climate change. So one of the long-term goals for this fund is to um, have effective animal advocacy be established as a large scale academic field where um, studies can come out for decades to come and help us all make more informed decisions on how to help best animals. Uh, we don't currently have an option for individual donors to give to this fund, although we may in the future. Uh, but at this point, we are looking for a 
a generous donor to support the continuation of this fund. So um, to all the millionaires out there or anyone you know who's a, a particularly high net worth um, donor in our fields, please put them in touch with us. We'd love to chat more about the um, potential of, of continuing this fund um, with a new model and uh, you know, continuing to create new research to inform effective animal advocacy. So these are the 2020 giving options that we recommend. So if you're a donor who really wants to be giving to places where um, you, know, you really can have a sure bet about your impact, where you can really rely on all the evidence that does exist, where you really wanna know that your donation is going to accomplish a lot of good for animals, I would recommend giving to our 2020 recommended charities, either one of them individually or to a recommended charity fund. If you're a donor who is interested in more speculative giving, who is willing to take a risk, who um, wants to you know, have a more high risk, high reward um, approach, or if you're particularly interested in capacity building in the movement, we would recommend giving to the ACE Movement Grants Program. And then if you're a donor who really understands the strategic importance of research in the field and um, the high level of impact that this can have in helping us make us all effective over the long term, we would recommend supporting our Animal Advocacy Research Fund. Uh, we do have tax, tax deductible giving options in many parts of the world, so you can check our website for that. And we even accept donations in cryptocurrency. Um, I know tomorrow is Giving Tuesday and there's a big match happening on Facebook. Um, and we do have, several, like I mentioned, a, a matching campaign coming up in the next few days for the recommended charity fund. So thank you so much for your time. Here's my email address. Um, please reach out anytime if you have further questions about what we talked about today. And I also um, welcome any questions you want to pass on through Katya in the remaining minutes that we have. All right. Thank you so much, Leah, for, this, for these insights. Um, I currently do not see any questions in the chat, but I have a quick one for you. So um, what is better? Is it going vegan or donating $50 a month to animal charity evaluators? Well, these things are very difficult to quantify, but in general, um, the amount of animals that you can spare or improve the lives of per dollar is actually extremely high within effective animal advocacy. Um, Rethink Priorities is an organization that's done a lot of interesting research on cost effectiveness. And um, I would assume if, you're, if your primary concern is you know, the direct amount of animals that you can spare per dollar um, or per effort, you'd be better off with a donation than by changing your own dietary choice. But of course, um, you know, changing your dietary choice is a high impact choice you can make for yourself and it might have longer term impacts like um, inspiring your friends or family to, to change their behavior as well. So um, I don't see there's a reason that you couldn't do both, but um, they're, both, they're both great ways to help animals. Okay, thank you so much, Leah. Thank you, Katya. Welcome to the Global Health and Development Session. Our guest for this session is Dr. Neil Body Shah, the Managing Director at GiveWell. 
Uh, Buddy uh, was previously the CEO and co-founder at ID Insight, and he also worked at the World Bank at the MIT's uh, Poverty Action Lab, JPO. He holds an AB from Harvard, an MD from Einstein College of Medicine, and an MPA in International Development from Harvard Kennedy School. Buddy, welcome to the Effective Giving Day. Thanks, Pablo. It's great to be here. Great. Uh, let's jump uh, right in. Uh, for those of us that are familiar with the effective giving space, uh, GiveWell is the gold standard when it comes to helping people that are living in lower income countries. However, for those in the audience who are maybe newer to the, to the movement, um, other institutions like large universities, uh, maybe the Gates Foundation, or maybe a Nobel Prize winner or two, uh, may be more familiar. Uh, could you explain what GiveWell's role is in the effective giving space and also very specifically how you think about effectiveness? Yeah, thanks, Pablo. It's a great question. Uh, and it's certainly true that there are a lot of organizations and individuals doing great work in this broader space. You know, I think the question that GiveWell is just obsessed with is how can we direct funding to find the opportunities that improve human well-being the most per dollar? In other words, where are the places where we can turn dollars into lives saved or incomes improved the most per dollar? And I think this core obsession around maximizing the impact of every dollar you spend has a number of flow through effects to what we do and what distinguishes us and hopefully makes us valuable in this broader space. So I think the first element of that um, is that we're looking to find the few number of opportunities that improve lives the most in the world, rather than trying to generate new evidence or rate all of the charities that exist. So we're really trying to find the very best giving opportunities in the world and to package those in a way that are really actionable if you're someone that's trying to figure out where should I make, spend my charitable dollars so that they improve lives the most. Um, and once you get into the weeds with that broader framing of how do we use dollars to improve lives as much as possible, um, I think it has a number of implications for how GiveWell does its work. The first is that you know, we spend a lot of time scouring the academic literature and talking to experts as well as practitioners in the field running global health and development programs to try to figure out which are the programs that have evidence of most effectiveness. Uh, and so we're not, we're looking through all the literature, published papers that show and try to understand the effectiveness of different kinds of programs and then take a very critical eye into which of those are better versus worse. So it's not enough for us to say, you know, program X has found to improve the health of people in this country. We're trying to figure out, well, is that the best way? And do those findings actually hold up in um, other countries or if you scale them up in practice beyond just uh, the contours of a particular academic study? So the first core characteristic is searching for the opportunities that have robust evidence of effectiveness. The second is that even if a program has been proven to improve lives, we're interested in finding out how much do they improve lives per dollar. So thinking about the cost effectiveness of different programs um, and then comparing them against each other so that we can actually have some kind of ranked ordering around which programs do the most good per dollar spent. And then finally layering on all the practical questions around is this organization uh, able to deliver the program in really challenging environments do they have room for more funding? A lot of organizations might just be at the full capacity in terms of their organizational um, abilities. Can they actually turn new dollars into effective spending and continue to save or improve lives uh, as much as possible? Uh, and when you put together all of these things of scouring the evidence uh, and the literature base for the most effective giving opportunities and really having the lens of which is most cost effective, um, you end up with this list uh, of a small number of organizations that save or improve lives um, with incredible cost effectiveness. And over just last year, based on Givel's recommendations, uh, our community of donors were able to direct over $150 million to these programs. Uh, and happy to get into you know, some of the details uh, of, of what those programs actually look like in practice. Uh, that's, that's quite impressive. And uh, it's, I think it's really valuable work for, for donors uh, that face just so many, so many uh, options behind before them. Um, you've been looking for these uh, outstanding giving opportunities for over a decade now. Uh, but um, 
your recommendations have tended not to change dramatically from one year to the next. However, I do know that there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes, thousands of hours of research. So can you explain what your research process looks like and how you constantly reevaluate your recommendations? Yeah, it's a great question, Pablo. And I mean, you're absolutely right. Over the last five years, the list isn't changing dramatically. We have added um, three new programs uh, and dropped one. But I think the high level takeaway for why the list doesn't change that much from year to year is that despite tens of thousands of hours of really talented critical research time at Gibble that goes into this, um, it's not changing because these are exceptionally uh, cost-effective ways to save or improve lives. Uh, and so if you think about our list of recommended charities, you can broadly divide them into two buckets, programs that save lives and programs that improve incomes. Um, so life-saving or life-improving interventions. Um, and there's three parallel research processes that are going into generating this list. The first is that once something is already on the list, whether that's anti-malarial bed nets to protect children from getting malaria and dying, vitamin A supplementation to protect people from measles, diarrheal disease, and respiratory infections, um, that we want to make sure that just because something has been proven to be effective once, that it continues to deliver that impact at scale. So the first kind of set of research priorities is doing the due diligence every year to make sure that our top charities continue to save or improve lives with extreme cost effectiveness. So the types of research activities that we're doing in that first bucket are looking at every organization's monitoring data from each year. Are they continuing to deliver these effective programs to the scale um, and with the fidelity that uh, we need to see in order to believe that they're continuing to have a lot of impact. Another type of thing that we're doing in continually vetting the existing top charities is actually updating our views on their cost effectiveness based on changes in the academic literature. So just last year, we did an analysis around modeling how long we think anti-malarial bed nets actually last in the field. Because, you know, we have this whole model that it's $5 to deliver and hang a bed net in a rural part of a malaria endemic region in Africa, um, but a lot of the cost effectiveness of how many lives uh, are gonna be saved with donations to antimalarial bed nets depends on how long they actually last in the field. You know, they're gonna be uh, subject to all kinds of things that, um, you know, daily use, weather, et cetera. And so whether a bed net lasts for a year versus two years versus three years has big implications for how cost effective it is and whether there's another opportunity that might be better than it. Um, and then finally, we also fund new research to update our views on how cost effective existing charities are. So in you know, the next guest, the keynote speaker is, um, you know, a colleague of, of GiveWell's, Michael Kramer, and GiveWell funded a 20-year follow-up study that Professor Kramer and co-authors did to see how much do kids' incomes improve if they receive anti-parasitic deworming medications when they're kids. And so those are the types of activities that we need to keep on investigating in order to make sure that the things that are already on the list are continually um, saving or improving lives as much as we think they are, and so that we can have a really refined, up-to-date list of those. But in parallel to vetting the top charities, the research team is also constantly scouring the literature, talking to experts and practitioners around what are new potential programs that could save or improve lives more than the current places that we're investing in. Um, and this work is really important and exciting. And while over the last five or six years, it's only led to three additional top charity recommendations, I think that's more a sign that what's already on the list is really, really cost effective at turning philanthropic dollars into improved lives um, rather than a real, you know, rather than any lack of effort in trying to find things that can outperform those. Um, and then the third type of work that goes into our research process and making sure that these, in fact, are some of the best ways to turn your dollars into improvements in human well-being is actually trying to improve our core cost effectiveness model. So a lot of our decision making is informed by a cost effectiveness model that we apply to any charity that we evaluate. Um, and there are just some really tough questions embedded in that. So, for instance, anyone that's trying to do good in the world is inevitably gonna be forced between choosing between different outcomes that all look good. So do you save someone's life by investing in a public health intervention? Do you 
try to improve someone's income through cash transfers, or do you invest in improving educational outcomes? If you have a fixed amount of money, you need to make certain moral trade-offs around, do you save someone's life or do you improve their income? Um, and you know, we're constantly trying to answer that question, both through our own internal process, uh, as well as having doing large-scale surveys with the communities and individuals that are affected by our programs to better understand how they make those trade-offs between programs that could save lives of members of their community versus improve their incomes. Excellent. Um, I do want to remind our audience that we may have time for maybe one or two questions at the end of the, of the session. Uh, but before that, uh, I hear you have actually published your list of uh, 2020 recommendations. And this year, there is a change. So uh, do you want to briefly um, mention the charities that repeat in that list? And which is this organization that has been able to secure a spot in this really hard to get into list? Yeah, absolutely. So on the income improving uh, side, there are two. One is Give Directly's cash transfers, which just finds some of the lowest income households in the world and directly transfers them cash. Uh, and those through randomized controlled trials, we found that those households actually, you know, they're the ones that know their problems best and, and can do a lot of good with just direct cash transfers. Um, the other income improving intervention is deworming. So providing um, pills for children to get rid of parasitic infections uh, and just $100 can deworm 100 kids. And the interesting thing based on Professor Kramer's work and others is that that investment leads to over a thousand dollars in increased income over the lifetime of these kids. So large economic increase from early childhood deworming. And then on the life-saving side, we have several organ and within deworming, the organizations are things like Evidence Action, Sight Savers, Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, and the End Fund. And then on the life-saving side, all of our life-saving interventions you can roughly save the life of one individual between three to five thousand dollars, which is you know really incredible um, when you think about being able to actually save the life of someone who otherwise would have died. Um, and those are largely within preventable public health diseases. So in malaria, malaria consortium seasonal malaria chemo prevention for seven dollars treats a child during the high season of malaria. Um, and ends up saving a life for every three or five thousand dollars spent. Um, Against Malaria Foundation's long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets, it's five dollars to distribute a net. Um, and then vitamin A supplementation with Helen Keller International. Um, vitamin A supplementation protects people against diarrheal disease, measles, and respiratory infection. Over a quarter million people die every year from vitamin A um, supplementation-related illnesses. Um, and then finally, the most recent is new incentives program in northern Nigeria, where there's very low immunization rates. We know that by immunizing children, you can save a lot of lives. And so new incentives provides conditional cash transfers for families to go to the clinic to help offset the cost of traveling there to get overcome behavioral burdens and get more children immunized. And $47 leads to um, an additional complete immunization. And again, like the other life-saving interventions, this amounts to around three to $5,000 per death averted, um, which is really incredible when you think about it. Um, and that program, we were funding as early as 2014 to incubate new incentives, conditional cash transfers program. Um, and it just goes to show how long it takes to work through operational models and actually generate the evidence to show that a program is really effective and meets this bar um, of extreme cost effectiveness. It, it is amazing. When you think uh, how much we invest in saving a life in, in rich countries, uh, $3,000 to $5,000 is, is um, an incredible deal, I think, for donors. Um, okay, unless we have uh, questions from the audience or, or maybe before, uh, one final question uh, would be, I know that GiveWell is constantly looking for ways to expand the research. Um, how, how are you thinking about this? Where are you looking? And are, are there any avenues that look uh, especially promising as of today? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, under the headline mission that we have, which is how do we improve human well-being as much as possible um, per dollar spent? So far, we focus on finding true, proven, cost-effective programs with a lot of evidence behind them. Um, and as you could tell from my description, that often means directly funding a health commodity or sending cash to someone. 
but we're thinking about areas where we could have more leverage per dollar spent. And two examples that we're currently actively researching come to mind. The first is in policy change and technical assistance. So, you know, the governments of developing countries are by far the largest spenders in global health and development. And so rather than directly buying bed nets or distributing pills, what if we could invest in an organization that helps to improve the effectiveness of the government spending their own money, um, which is often in the billions of dollars or multilateral that are spending billions of dollars, uh, and you get a lot more leverage per philanthropic dollar spent. I think there's a big question of how cost effective that is because it relies on other individuals besides the ones that we're funding. But thinking about, you know, can we influence policy? Can we improve the effectiveness of, of government programming is one area. Um, and uh, I think it remains to be seen whether we find areas there that outperform the current top charities. But it does seem promising that, you know, if we can get the government of Indonesia to improve their tobacco policy or support the government of Liberia in scaling up programs in preventive health space using global fund dollars or their own domestic spending, um, then that could be a big amplifier on the philanthropic dollars of GiveWell donors. I think that the, this idea of leverage is really interesting. And uh, it, it really does reflect what effective giving is about, really looking for what are the avenues for greatest impact wherever they are, whether they are the ones that make you feel best or not. Um, yeah, okay, so, absolutely. Um, Something I, I, I've, I, I did want to ask you as well. Um, you know, there are different organizations around. Um, other evaluators have been mentioned before. Uh, what are common misconceptions or misunderstandings about what GiveWell does or what GiveWell does not do? Yeah, so, you know, I think there are a couple of misconceptions that come to mind. The first is that, you know, we're not a charity evaluator in the traditional sense. You know, GiveWell was started because um, you know, some of my, my colleagues were basically trying to figure out how, where they should donate their own money. And they found a real lack of actionable information for everyday donors to figure out how do we turn our dollars into actual improvements in people's lives. Um, and so the whole evolution of GiveWell has really been about finding the best places to um, invest in that improve human lives the most rather than trying to rate everything under the sun. And so what we're really looking to do is find the best giving opportunities rather than to try to rate everything that's out there. Um, I think the second misconception, uh, which you could even take away from our conversation so far, is that GiveWell is solely focused on organizations that have randomized control really rigorous evidence. That certainly makes up the bulk of our recommendations to date. Um, but what we're really about, again, is finding the best giving opportunities. And some point down the line, that might include giving opportunities where there's less of a rigorous evidence base, but there's higher return upside. Um, and that, you know, there might be more risk, but you could cause a big change, say, by trying to um, help influence or inform a pu public policy decision. Um, and so, and then the third misconception is that, you know, we're just about global health. Um, and the reality is that it's just that we found really phenomenal giving opportunities there. We're open conceptually to other um, sectors and outcomes, but it's really got to beat this pretty difficult bar that you could take that $3,000 and spend it elsewhere, but you're going to forego saving someone's life who otherwise would have died. And so, that other thing you invest in has got to be really, really good to forego spending it on these proven um, opportunities that can actually save someone's life. Uh, so I think those are some of the, the misconceptions um, and also reflection of some of GiveWell's own priorities as we look to the future. Perfect. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, for those of us working to bring effective giving to other countries, uh, the work you are doing is simply invaluable. So uh, thank you very much for what you do. Yeah, thanks a lot for the conversation, Pablo. Okay, so on to our next session. Thank you, buddy. Thanks.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Jack Lewis and I'm the Executive Director at One for the World. We ask people to pledge 1% of their income to give wells charities. Actually, of course, what we think is you should give what you can. But if you haven't tried effective giving before, or you're not sure if you can afford it, or you're not sure that this is what you want to do with all of your charitable giving, we think 1% is a great place to start to see whether it suits you. Because we believe all of us can live on 99% of our income. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Professor Michael Kramer, who is one of the world's most influential development economists. He is a pioneer behind both the research methods and the actual research that has led to many of the recommendations that you've heard about this evening. He's going to run you through some of his most consequential work, so I won't steal his thunder, but it is fair to say that he has produced several of the most important studies in the field of development economics. And he's going to a 15 minute presentation about his career, but a big part of this evening is you getting the opportunity to ask questions of Professor Kramer. So please use the chat function on YouTube. Those questions will come to me and I'll try to get through as many as I can. But for now, Professor Kramer, thank you so much for being with us. Great, thank you so much. Um, what I try to do today is describe a little bit about the uh, the experimental approach in development economics, which uh, is what uh, Abhijit Banerjee, Esther Duflo, and I uh, received last year's Nobel Prize for in economics, and then give a few examples to, to illustrate um, those features and to explain why I think that the approach is, is useful for policy, uh, for uh, including for private individuals um, so, uh, thinking about how to allocate charitable funds, why well, it's useful for science, although I probably won't go into that so much, um, and why it's useful as a source of innovation. And then after going through those examples, I'll say a little bit about the need uh, and some evidence on the impact of institutions to try to support, uh, support innovation using the experimental method uh, for, for development. I'm in a bit of trouble advancing my slides here. Let's go. There we go. Okay. So the um, you know, I think when for those of you who have some familiarity with the uh, with the uh, with development economics and with the experimental approach, um, I think the first thing people think about, and certainly the uh, the reason I got initially got excited about this approach, and um, was because it provides a way of getting that causal impact. So let me explain you know, what I mean by that. You know, traditionally in, in social science, uh, it's very difficult to isolate the impact of a program from potential confounding factors. So if you're trying to understand what's the impact of going to a private school as opposed to a public school, that's very difficult. Kids who go to private school differ in all sorts of ways from kids who go to public school. How do you disentangle the impact? economists and, and others have come up with all sorts of interesting and, and often useful statistical approaches to dealing with this. But you know, the, the basic idea of the experimental approach, at least initially, was to try to do what is done, for example, in medicine, of have a randomized controlled trial. And so, for example, if there's a private school or that has a limited number of slots available uh, through scholarships, to if there's a lottery to allocate that, which sometimes there is for fairness reasons, compare the winners and losers of that lottery. And then on average, winners and losers should be similar on other characteristics, except whether they had the opportunity to go to, to the private school. And then that would allow um, an estimate of the impact of the private school on, on whatever outcome you're interested in, uh, test scores, wages uh, later on, et cetera. So I think that's that's certainly how I initially thought about the experimental approach, but I think it turned out to have much broader applicability, and it led to a I think a, a change in the way that economists do research. And ironically, some of these changes were things that were initially seen as constraints imposed by the experimental method. The first one was, you know, if you if you think about analyzing 
stereotype of economists is they get a data set somebody else has collected and they analyze it using various statistical methods. That's, that can be a very useful technique, but it doesn't involve a lot of time in the field talking to, talking to, the, to the, the human beings involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the particular context you're looking at. And the experimental approach, the researcher has to spend a lot of time with um, you know, students, with teachers, with, with uh, school administrators, with government officials or NGO officials. Um, if they're trying to evaluate a program, uh, they need to do all of that. They need to design questionnaires. They need to pretest the questionnaires. All of that involves a lot of interaction. And that interaction provides a much richer set of context. Uh, so um, you know, in a way, it's moving economists to be more like some other sort of qualitative social scientists who, who, who think that type of context is very important. And, and I think they're they're. Right. Um, another factor about um, about the experimental approach is it often involves taking on specific practical problems. And again, this was sometimes seen as a disadvantage. Okay, you're looking at the impact of textbooks on test scores, but we need to get at much larger questions, and you're only asking a very answering a very specific question. People saw that as a disadvantage. I think what we found is that by looking at specific practical problems in a way that provides evidence that's as clear cut, and obviously nothing in life is completely clear, clear cut, but as, as relatively clear cut as, uh, as evidence from randomized controlled trials, you're forced to confront some issues which might not have been in your theoretical framework to begin with. And that may require you to, to go back from the data and think about your theory, and in some cases, uh, realize that your theory needs revision and that you, you need to uh, you need to develop new theory. And I won't discuss it here due to time constraints, but um, I, in fact, did a study on textbooks, which sounds like a sort of boring question with an obvious answer. But certainly the, the, um, the, the obviously textbooks have to have to help uh, in a context where a few kids have textbooks. Um, the attempts to use statistical controls tended to indicate that, it, that when we actually did the study, we found results that were at some variance from that. And, uh, and I think that points both to the importance of really isolating causal impact. But in that case, that also led us to think about the theory and, um, and, and come up with, with uh, some new theoretical ideas. So that's the, the third element. Fourth element of this is it's inherently collaborative. Um, collaborative between researchers and practitioners, because you're typically working with an NGO or a government or a private firm. And, and it's collaborative between different types of researchers. If it's education research, you're working with educationalists often. And I think that brings a lot of ideas into economics that might not otherwise have been there in a, in a way that I think is very valuable. And then finally, it's iterative. There can be rapid, rapid cycles. You get one result, you see something that you thought worked, didn't work. So you try something else, you see something worked, but then you say, well, which element drove it? You know, this was a costly program with five different elements. Which one drives the results? Or you see something had an effect different than what you might think from the existing theory, and you design a new experiment to, to test the theory. And then in an iteration taps, and it's not just within research teams, but also across research teams. Um, so I think these five characteristics, which I'll you know, maybe try to illustrate a little with some examples, makes this very useful for policy, including, including the decisions of private individuals about how to allocate their, their philanthropic funds. But I think it makes things useful for science. So I'm happy to discuss that in Q&A if it comes up. But one thing I'd like to emphasize, which I don't think has been emphasized enough, is I think it makes experimental method a very useful tool for innovation, these five features. So let me give some, some concrete examples. So one is on school-based e-learning. So one of the, the first evaluations I was involved in was um, not, not the first, you know, for example, the textbook one came, came earlier, but this was an, an evaluation of a very small NGO which was running a deworming program. They'd initially tried some other things, but then they decided they were gonna try deworming. Um, so roughly as background, nearly 1 billion people worldwide are at risk of intestinal worms. 
and they're particularly common among school-age children. So the World Health Organization has recommended that in endemic areas would be school-based mass treatment. The medicine's very cheap, safe, um, but it's pretty expensive to diagnose kids. So they recommend just doing mass treatment. So, um, so this NGO decided it was gonna try this, initially in 25 schools, then another 25, then a third group of 25. Um, and they staggered the rollout over time for logistical reasons. It was a really small NGO. Before they'd only worked in seven schools at a time. Um, and, the, the, um, and so we could use the staggered rollout to measure the impact of the program. And we saw that school absences dropped by roughly a quarter. Moreover, there were spillover effects on untreated children and on children in nearby schools. Um, the disease uh, spreads through fecal contamination, which then can get into the soil or into the water. And uh, um, you know, some of that spread of the eggs uh, was, was um, you know, it seems was um, interrupted, not fully interrupted, partially interrupted. And we, we then, we've been following these, um, these students who are in this program and now for you know, 20 years. And they're, so they're now adults. And we see that people are earning more and consuming, consuming more. You know, economists tend to use, uh, often in developing countries, we realize it's easier to measure consumption than income. In any case, either way, these numbers look uh, pretty similar either way. And that's a, because the medication is incredibly cheap, and even the administration, when delivered through schools, is very cheap. Um, you know, the, the long run earnings were enough to pay for the program 100 times over. So, um, so we, we found these, you know, I think very impressive results. Since then, um, the the NGO Evidence Action has gotten uh, very involved in this, and and it, it, its mode of operating is to work with governments. And governments have been been and um, have been persuaded. Uh, um, so Evidence Action is now partnering with governments to reach over 280 million children a year in India, in Kenya, in Nigeria, Pakistan. Uh, the cost is less than 50 cents per, per child per year. That's all inclusive delivery costs as well as the um, medicine costs. The medicine itself is extremely cheap. Um, so that's you know that's one example. Now that's a that's an example that is you know, one particular thing that's a you know I think relevant for policy. But you can say, well, you know, what do we learn from from science or science from that? One thing that Here's something that turned out to be a quite general pattern. So there's a general issue of what's the impact of charging for preventive health. And I think the model that a lot of economists uh, were trained in, certainly when, you know, when I was in graduate school, which predated the rise of behavioral economics, was that you know, individual consumers, if something's worthwhile, individual consumers will, will buy it, unless there's an externality. In this case, there is an externality, but you still might think that individuals would buy the deworming medicine. Now, the program that I just told you about was a free program. The NGO, um, and I, I don't want to just blame economists for this. This was very common among, among NGOs as well. People thought it was really important to charge fees for, charge at least something or else people wouldn't value uh, um, things they got for free. What we found was that, so we worked with the NGO, we persuaded them to try, some, try it for free in some places. We saw that even a small fee dramatically reduced uptake, down to 17% from 70% when it was free. Um, I think the only reason was 70% rather than much higher was because it was part of a research study. People had to sign to give permission, and um, so there was some effort involved. Um, but this pattern of dramatic reductions in uptake in response to small fees has been found in other preventive and, and uh, health contexts. Um, and um, bed nets, water treatment, and so on. And that's, I think, led to some thinking about what are the factors behind that and some scientific progress. It's also led to a broader policy change. Inexpensive preventive health products are increasingly provided for free. Let me talk about one example where, which is unfortunately a sector that's lagging in this, so there's still a fair amount of effort to charge. Um, so this is a sort of a second area of research. Um, this is uh, on water. So diarrheal disease from contaminated water is a, a big source of, of child death. Um, 
Kenya, for example, is thought to be the number two source of child death. Um, so we look initially, and this will give you a sense of the iteration, an NGO evaluated an NGO project that was um, trying to encase open spring water sources in concrete to reduce contamination. And we did see the contamination fell, fell by two thirds of the source. But then when we tested people's water at home, it was only a one third reduction. And it turns out a lot of that was because the water got recontaminated in storage or transport. The diarrhea rates still fell, they fell by a quarter, but not as much as you would have liked. But one thing you can do to address that is to treat the water uh, with, for example, with chlorine, that, that keeps the water safe for a while. The chlorine stays in the water, reacts with any microorganisms in there. The problem is the, the way that chlorine was being distributed is it was being sold in small bottles that cost about 20 or 30 cents for a month's supply. Um, and only about 7% of the population was buying those in this area at that time. We tried to think about, well, how can we design a solution to this using ideas and insights from behavioral economics. So one, you won't be surprised for what I said, was we wanted to make this free. We also want to make this as convenient as possible. Uh, we want it to be salient to, to provide a reminder um, and to be, help, help people in forming habits. We want it to be public so people could ask other people about it, so maybe social norms could form around it. We developed this approach of the chlorine dispensers, which you see in the picture. Um, these are uh, containers of the same water treatment solution that are put in by the water point. So where people are going to collect their water anyway. So these, this led to an increase in treatment from 7% to 50%, somewhat more, you know, roughly 50%, a little bit more. Um, that, um, that, that provides clean water for now for, it's been scaled up also by evidence action, uh, provides clean water for 2 million people in Kenya, Uganda, and Malawi. Um, and that's that's a give all standout charity. Um, costs about $1.50 per person per year. It's um, They're getting 55% uh, uh, usage rates. And you know, the, their estimate is this prevents over 450,000 cases of diarrhea. We're just about to bring out a paper that looks at the impact of this on child survival. Um, and it looks like we're finding very large effects on child survival. There's a, like any study, there's some qualifications. So, uh, but, um, but it, it looks like um, you know, very, very large effects, um, making it very, very cost-effective in, in saving lives. We give another example, not from the health, but from a, an agriculture example. Um, this is something where I'd, I'd been doing research on um, digital messages to provide farmers with information. And um, this is something that um, we were finding positive results on. A colleague, I was working in Kenya, a colleague was working in India, also finding positive results. And I was approached by a philanthropist who, who was looking for, said, you know, pitch me something. So told him about our results. Uh, he encouraged us to, um, to to set up an organization to address this. So we founded an NGO uh, together with others called uh, Precision Development. And it initially worked in agriculture, now it also works in education. Recently did a, had an article come out in Science that evaluated the, not just the impact of precision development's work, but of digital agricultural extension more broadly. And what we found was that the there were, um, we combined many different studies and, and uh, showed that this affects behavior and uh, and also evidence of the of an impact on farm yields profits. Although that that evidence is uh, there's not many studies on that, so um, um, that evidence isn't quite as uh, strong statistically speaking in terms of statistical significance. But in each case, the magnitudes of these effects are tenfold. Uh, the cost of the program. So um, the um, um, the you know, I think this is also a, a very good investment. The um, and I think that those I think it's likely to get much better over time because precision development and and others are using A B testing to improve these systems over time. The technology is getting better and better as more and more people get smartphones, for example. You can do things like 
provide video or get uh, farmers take pictures of pests and send those back to be at, to, so that they can be identified and recommendations can be given. So precision development's also working with governments in uh, India, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, um, Nigeria now, um, I believe Brazil starts soon in Brazil. Um, and, um, and I think it's, it's, again, using the same approach of basing, basing things on evidence, using A-B testing to continually improve, and then working with governments, it's been able to achieve uh, quite, quite strong scale. And it was just a few days ago named to give well standout chair. I think these examples to illustrate how the experimental method can be useful in generating practical, scalable innovations. I don't want to give the wrong idea, by the way. There are lots of things that don't work. I gave you the textbook example uh, earlier. Um, I, you know, um, I think if you think about the, um, so I think you, you want to pay attention to the evidence. Um, um, you know, some things, textbooks are a great example, but common sense or even the available Non-experimental evidence suggests have a big impact. Um, the story turns out to be um, more complicated when you when you when you start doing getting experimental evidence. Um, one thing I would note is if you think about the private sector, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're running A/B tests using the experimental method all the time. You know, constantly tweaking their systems to get them to optimize them to to make as much profit as possible. That's the same type of process that's used to you know, get as many people to buy from Amazon as possible. That approach could be used to better deliver information to farmers or to uh, for, you know, improve, uh, improve, create educational opportunities for kids who can't get regular schooling because of COVID. Uh, there's a, a thousand things that can be done, but that won't be done on its own because the profit opportunities aren't, aren't the same. And that's, I think we need public or philanthropic funding, and we also need institutions for this. So I'd like to say a little bit about that sort of broader issue beyond sort of the individual uh, examples. So I helped co-found a fund within USAID called Development Innovation Ventures, um, and that provides open funding to support innovation across you know, different sources of innovation, you know, private firms, researchers, NGOs, uh, across sectors, so uh, across geographies, and across scaling approaches, both things that would scale commercially and things that would scale through adoption by the public sector. We have a pretty broad definition of innovation. Our approach to sort of discipline our funding is that we have a rules-based approach. We give small amounts of funding for piloting, larger amounts, but still fairly modest for testing. And then the larger scale funding comes in only after other strong evidence. So, that was the approach, and that's designed to transition things to scale because it's not typically enough just to have the research results. So the the um, you know we're, that's been around for about ten years. By the way, I should say it's if you if you're interested, in, some of you may be innovators out there. Uh, please go on the web, look us up, and and uh, feel free to submit an application if if you think there's a good match there. Um, the um, so. Because we've been around for 10 years, it takes time for innovations to scale, but we thought, let's look at our early portfolio, uh, 2010 through 12, and see what our track record is. So here, this chart sort of shows the, the, um, the impact of the innovations. So there are 41 innovations in that early portfolio. So if you look at the first uh, you know, 30 of them, you don't, or even, you don't see that much, they haven't reached that many people. And that's typical when you're funding innovation. Most, most uh, a large fraction of the total benefit is going to come from a small fraction of the projects. You know, that would be true if you're a venture capital fund. You know, you know, you're not going to make money on everything, but if you get a Google or Facebook in there, you're going to make, you're going to do well. Well, it looks like the same thing is true for social innovation. So these are, these are, these are the nine innovations that went over a million, which I think is actually a great track record relative to the sector. And I think is in part because of the um, involvement with researchers and the use of the experimental method. A lot of these successful ones uh, use that. And we've done some very basic statistical analysis of 
of what are the predictors of scale. Um, those things are seem to be associated with scale, and there's some other factors as well, like just inexpensive innovations are more likely to scale. But aside from this, that question of scaling, really what we care about is what are the benefits and what's the ratio of benefits to cost. So the, the amount that we, was spent uh, by the US government on this was $16 million on those in those first couple of years. We've, we're not able to get good estimates of the benefits for every innovation, but we looked at out of those 40, 41 uh, innovations, 43 grants, uh, we looked at just five projects where we were able, that had reached over a million users and where we could get the data. And we see that the benefits of this, uh, these are our latest numbers, which aren't the official numbers. Uh, I hope to bring them out soon, a new set of numbers soon, but um, we did an analysis about a year ago and, uh, and what I'm showing you now is our updated numbers. Uh, so that, with that important uh, asterisk on it, um, looks like the uh, social benefits pay for the cost of the portfolio 17 times over. Um, the cost per person reached was just 16 cents. So I think this is just a fantastic uh, investment, this type of um, institution to support innovation. Just to conclude, I think um, what I'd like to stress is that experiments can isolate causal impact, but they're also useful tools for innovation. But you know, we need to invest in that innovation and we need, we need funds for that, but we also need institutions for it. And I, I, just a couple of months ago, I accepted a new job where I'm now at the University of Chicago. That's where I'm talking from. And I came here in large part to help start a development innovation lab here, which is going to, um, which is going to work to use these types of tools to, uh, to create innovations for the developing world. And uh, if people are, are interested in this field, you know, happy to, to, to follow up um, uh, by you know, um, take any questions now, but also to follow up afterwards separately. So thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Kramer. That was really interesting. And we've had some fantastic questions coming in through the chat. Um, I'd like to start with one from Sophie, who said, um, could you comment on the value of donating to support the type of research that you're describing versus donating to charities that have been shown to be effective from that research? You know, I think they're, um, no, this is not going to be a super satisfactory answer. Um, I think they're both, they're both, um, they can both have a huge impact. You know, I, I mentioned uh, evidence action as one, or precision agriculture, or precision development as two organizations. I think they're, I'm, I should disclose, by the way, I'm on the board of precision development. Um, um, so, um, but um, I think they're both great organizations um, and, and that would be a, a very effective use of, of, of funds. I also think that um, sustaining this type of, of research is also very important. Um, and there are a number of organizations that do that. Um, uh, Poverty Action Lab at MIT, um, Harvard has uh, evidence for policy design. You know, we've just started the lab here at Chicago. Um, um, uh, Berkeley has, uh, uh, sorry, University of California more broadly, uh, not just Berkeley has uh, something called SEGA. Um, so there are a number of great, um, great organizations. I don't mean to just focus on four US institutions, there are other ones as well. But I, I won't keep listing acronyms. Fantastic. Um, another really good question from Jesper, who says, um, how well does this scientific approach translate to settings with extremely high degrees of uncertainty, such as some of the animal welfare causes that we heard about earlier this evening? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, So, well, let me let me first say things where you know I think this probably couldn't well be couldn't be used. I think there are things like you know people are worried about um, um, an asteroid hitting the Earth or about um, artificial and you know negative impacts of artificial intelligence and really dystopian scenarios. I don't I don't have a way of assessing assessing those things. Um, um, so I, it's hard for me to comment. Animal welfare, um, you know, there might actually be some cases where we could, um, you know, if you wanted to understand, I'm making this up, I'm not an expert in the field, but if you wanted to understand, well, what's the impact of a, 
of a particular type of education campaign and getting people to switch from uh, to become vegetarian or to switch from factory farmed uh, um, meat to uh, free range chickens or something. You know, you might be able to assess the impact of of, the, of that. Um, I, I think you could, in principle. How do right, well, maybe? No way, no way that randomized trials can tell you how you should, what, what value you should put on each, you know, that you have to ask the philosophers for advice on, or look in your heart. Or, yeah. Maybe an area for, for the research and thought then. Um, Shiri has raised a couple of the potential ethical issues with randomized control trials, and in particular, the use of RCTs mainly in a development economic context where we might not be happy to use them in the context of developed countries. Um, can you speak to those ethical concerns and also what you can do to safeguard against them? Um, so, you know, I think randomized trials um, also are, are can and are used in to address problems in higher income countries as well. So, um, there's a whole set of RCTs. I mean, I mentioned that, that um, well, there are a whole set of RCTs on, try, on savings behavior, on working with, um, you know, they're, they're working to examine, so in this sort of a U.S. example, the U.S., um, a lot of savings is done through uh, pension plans, and employer employees contribute, and then employers might match that. And there are different, and but employees have to enroll on these plans. And there've been different attempts to look at a whole set of, of, uh, of, of different ways to try to increase employee savings rates and to get uh, people to adopt more uh, efficient savings. So I think, that, I think that these can be used for problems affecting uh, developed countries as well as uh, you know, high income countries as well as low and middle income countries. But um, fundamentally, I think we've got important social problems, and it's important to try to find ways to address them. And some of sometimes things that we think are effective turn out not to be, and things that we, um, we, we don't realize are so effective turn out to be extraordinarily effective. So trying to get evidence on that is important. Now, obviously, in the process of doing that, you have to be concerned about, uh, about human subjects and the rights of, of human subjects, and they're, you know, all of these um, experiments, um, well, there's procedures to go through and universities have review boards and the institutions in developing countries set up their own review boards. And typically um, these evaluations will go through both procedures, both in the country where they're taking place, wherever that is, and in the university of the researchers uh, um, that the researchers are working. Okay, thank you. Um, there are some more great questions we're not going to have time for, um, but I just wanted to finish by talking about your own giving. You have taken the Giving What We Can pledge to give away 10% or more of your income for your whole career. So I wondered if you could tell us why you wanted to do that and also which organisations you support with your own giving. Yeah, um, so you know, why did I want to do that? Fundamentally, because the money can make such a difference and it can clearly have so much, you know, as I think some of these examples illustrate and they're, they're not unique. Um, there are ways, you know, a, a dollar or a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, you go a lot farther and, and improve so many more lives, so much more, um, uh, with so much more uh, impact in a lower income setting than in certainly in, in my, than it would for me um, if I spent on, on you know my, on, on myself uh, or, or even you know, my family and the um, and then which organizations actually you know I've given to evidence I, all of the organizations uh, here to evidence mentioned it today I've given uh, substantial amounts to to evidence action on both both deworming and, and water um, uh, to precision uh, to precision development um, and also to support um, you know, academic research which um, which is tied to to these objectives and which is is um, um, so you know I think the I guess the 
most recent uh, uh, and, and, you know, large gift was um, Esther Abajid and I decided that we were going to give the funds that came from our uh, from the Nobel Prize to support um, support really the next generation of researchers in this in this area. Um, and we gave to something called the Weiss Fund, um, which is supported uh, in part by the, in, in much larger amounts by the Weiss family. And um, that's, it's administered, administered through the University of Chicago, um, but it's designed to provide funding to, you know, primarily to, it's a little bit broader than this, but primarily to uh, junior faculty and graduate students doing this type of research, but very specifically for things that are, um, not research for researchers sake alone, but research that's oriented towards improving the lives of the poor of poor people in poor countries. And you know, the emphasis of this, uh, to some extent, the program had been just a US program, but with the gift and with this very large uh, increased gift from the Weiss family, um, it's, it's now being broadened out globally and in particular to developing countries. Uh, so the researchers from around the world can, can participate. Fantastic. Well, uh, Professor Kramer, thank you so much for your time this evening. Uh, One for the World and many of the organisations that we've heard from tonight rely on your research and the methods that you've pioneered all the time. So we really do appreciate it. Your contribution to the field is uh, fantastic, as was recognised with your Nobel Prize last year. Um, Thank you very much to everyone who submitted questions. And I think now we're going to hear from Charlie Bressler to round off this evening. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you all for sticking around uh, for this, the final presentation. My name is Charlie Bressler. I'm the executive director of Peter Singer's nonprofit, The Life You Can Save. For those of you that don't know of Peter Singer, he's a world renowned philosopher. Um, some think one of the most influential philosophers in modern times. Um, and he started The Life You Can Save um, several years ago. And in this presentation, I want to do two things. First, I want to talk a little bit about the life you can save and differentiate the life you can save from GiveWell. And I thank Buddy for that great presentation. Buddy did a spectacular job. And then most importantly, I want to ask all of you to donate, to take advantage of the opportunity to actualize some of these ideas that you've been hearing about and actually save lives and reduce suffering and improve climate and improve the life of animals. So um, I have been given this slot to probably to ask for your money because I'm the fourth generation of textile salespeople. And maybe Sebastian knew that. I come from a long line of salespeople. And I did that uh, in a suit company before I joined The Life You Can Save about eight years ago. I want to uh, thank all of the Nobel Prize winners, and particularly Professor Kramer, who just heard from. Uh, the work they're doing and have done has enabled the work of Give Well and the Life You Can Save and One for the World. And without their strategy, we would not be as strong as we are today. And I know that, that Buddy and Jack from One for the World and myself were all indebted to the work uh, that Michael did. And I know that Peter Singer uh, feels the same way. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to talk a little bit about the life you can save uh, before I go on and try to pick your pocket a bit. Uh, the Life You Can Save is an organization that is different from GiveWell, I think, in two important ways. One, we have a broader list of nonprofits that we recommend although we overlap with GiveWell quite a lot and we use their research to get these recommendations of many of our nonprofits. And we could not do our work without the fabulous research that GiveWell does and we're indebted to them for that. The other way that we're different from GiveWell is we're committed to trying to popularize the concept of effective giving, to reach people who might normally not hear of GiveWell, who might have never heard of Peter Singer. And one of the ways that we're doing that is by taking Peter Singer's original book from 2009 that he wrote uh, talking about our moral obligation to give effectively and talking about some of the objections to effective giving and trying to overcome some of those objections. Last December, we launched an updated version of the life you can save in an ebook form and a celebrity read audiobook. Uh, people like Stephen Fry, Kristen Bell, Paul Simon each read chapters of the book. And we now have that ebook and audiobook available on the lifeyoucansave.org, which is our website. And if you go to the lifeyoucansave.org slash book, you can not only download either the ebook, audiobook, or both for yourself, but you can begin to share the book with your network. We believe that popularizing the idea of effective giving, the opportunity that is available to everyone to give in the most effective ways, as Buddy outlined in his talk, is a very important piece of promoting the very charities that both give well and the life you can save and one for the world and giving what we can recommend. So the Life You Can Save is in a sense, a popularizer of Peter Singer's ideas and trying to reach as many people as possible over the next five to 10 years. We hope to reach millions of people who've never heard of Peter Singer with these ideas and grow the number of donations going to Give Wells Charities as well as the ones that we recommend on our website. But today, I want to 
emphasize the importance of giving generously and the opportunity that everybody on this YouTube channel have and who've listened carefully to all these wonderful presentations. I like to say that the amazing thing is that you can save lives and reduce unnecessary suffering, improve animal welfare, facilitate climate improvement, all from the comfort of your own living room. You don't have to be a particularly brave person or a particularly scholarly person. Organizations like the ones that you've heard from today all make it relatively easy to find highly effective, highly impactful, and cost-effective organizations. Do you think this is too good to be true? Please investigate. My wife and I were not particularly generous donors until we read Peter Singer's book back in 2012. It was life-changing for us, and it has been for many, many other people who went from either non-effective donors or non-donors to highly effective donors, and it's raised millions and hundreds of millions of dollars through GiveWell, through The Life You Can Save, and other organizations. So I urge you to download the book, share the book, but most of all, I urge you to go to effectivegivingday.org and donate to all or some of these wonderful organizations and the charities they represent. Thanks very much for being here today. Mm -hmm.